say what you will about Trump. He is an incredibly consequential politician. Welcome to Roll Right In Money, brought to you by Max from Oceanic Partners, a VC firm based in San Francisco. I'm Fabian from Studio Alpha, Seed Fund, and Accelerator for Software Startups. So, Max, it's been a while, and it has been. It's, good to, it's good to see you, as always. Yeah, spontaneously, when I have a look at you, what comes to my mind? Burning Man. Burning Man, indeed. How was it? It was surprisingly spectacular, despite everyone knows about the flood, the deluge that happened, but just being there and then coming back out and into the real world and then reading, you know, how the press covered Burning Man, right? It was just so over sensationalized. It was apparently a complete debacle and disaster, and it was nothing like that. So it makes it difficult to trust the media. It's all just designed to, to clickbait and, uh, trigger you for the most part. It was, it was amazing. It, it was a truly amazing experience, kind of surprisingly. And I, I'm not a big rave kid. I'm not a big party kid, but this was pretty special. So it was the first time for you? First time for me, probably not the last. Okay. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't ever imagine myself being a, being a burner, but I guess life is full of surprises. Yeah. It's really, it's a very exciting and i think also an important experience at least you have to do this once in a lifetime but yeah i was there like five years ago yeah and i will, will go back one day absolutely you know many just go on a yearly base that was probably that would be a, a little bit too much for me yeah yearly it's a big project there's obviously a lot of a lot of logistics involved once in a lifetime a couple of times it's it's one of those bucket list things so then i have and i just was wondering Based on the, the second Republican presidential debate, well, you have seen it, I think, right? It's, it seems just a really pitched battle for a very distant second place. And so I guess they're all contending for what, for a VP, for some kind of book royalties. I, I'm not quite sure what, Vice the, president. what the calculation is. Yeah, clearly VP is, is the best any of them can, can probably hope for at this point, but no, I, I there are other uses, other uses for my time, but I do read the headlines. It, it apparently was, apparently was a bit of a chaotic mess. Was, they said that about Burning Man too. So who knows? So, um, and you think from the Republican side, it's going to be Trump again. That's what you think. Yeah. It seems like his lead is insurmountable and you can see that reflected in polls. You can see that reflected in the betting markets. Uh, there's probably no way that anybody who's in second place, whether that's you know, Nikki Haley or DeSantis or Vivek, there's just no way to bridge that gap. Say what you will about Trump. He is an incredibly consequential politician. He really changed the entire kind of orientation of his party at the very least and just American politics generally. Um, he has this kind of cult of personality that 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 surrounds him to some extent as well and the other candidates just they don't have that sort of firepower and trump just thrives on doing this and he was basically born to stir things up and just be in the public eye and that is what he's doing he's he's just very much in trump top form but no yes. I, I think he obviously is going to be the nominee i don't think there's a lot that can happen between now and the nomination that can detract from that. The VP is going to be an interesting choice, but it, it's, it, I mean, the Republican party seems to be the, the Trump show because it has that really committed, if not a majority of the party, there is a very strong core that constitutes a probably a plurality of, of the party that is, it's just inexorable. There's not a whole lot that you can do about it. Yeah. So the VP will be, what do you, what do you think? Good question. I don't know. Christy Noam, Nikki Haley, potentially. Vivek. You know, he, I it, think it would be Vivek. Vivek is a, it, it would be an interesting and it would be an interesting choice. I, I think Vivek is clearly smart. He's clearly stirring up the primary. He's, he's done, he's gotten a lot of mileage for just how off the radar he has been uh, politically. 
And clearly he was also just born to do this thing as well. He's a, he's a, he's a pretty capable debater. He clearly is pretty quick on his feet. Um, Track record. He's got, he's been successful in the private sector. We'll see. Very smart uh, guy. Smart guy. He's not, he's not, he's a smart guy. He's a, he, you could make the argument that Trump, you know, needs a, a more established kind of political anchor mm-hmm. in his administration. But you could also argue that, you know, for, it, it's just, it's such a, such a radically different kind of presidency that you can just do everything differently. You can choose, you know, a completely off the run VP and that would be the, the end of it. So interesting. It's, it's always, it's always just a big circus here. So always entertaining. And then following your words, Trump will be the candidate from the Republicans. Hence Biden will be the candidate of the Democrats. And then the election will be won by Biden. Then you have a president that goes towards 90. Yeah, that, that seems to be the consensus view. I, I don't have a particular stake in the debate. I just objectively watch the polls and the betting markets. I, I like the betting markets because they're just very dynamic and people have some skin in the game to place these bets. It seems like Trump is just a few points behind Biden as far as, as, far as betting markets. As far as polling, he, some polls he's ahead, some polls he's behind. Polls really need to be taken in the large aggregate. But yes, yeah, so far it seems Biden will be the nominee. He's you know, clearly, there, there's an age issue. There's some overhang from the Hunter story, the, the impeachment inquiry that, that um, the Republicans have fired up right now. So whether that impacts him or not, that's hard to say. He's clearly at the, you clearly get a lot of leverage as, a, as an incumbent. The incumbents, they typically maintain their, they keep their job for the most part. I don't know who's in, it seems like Gavin Newsom from California is, is in a distant second place, but then again, they're not, there's not a primary contest. It's just assumed that Biden will be the candidate as far as the actual race. It's, and I'm not a political expert by any means. I've been watching some polls and just how, how certain groups, they kind of shift in their alignment. And it seems like Trump is gaining ground in some in some specific key demos he's uh, gaining ground in some interestingly in some minority communities but this is happening in in states that he can't possibly swing so he might be making good gains in california but he's never going to win california right Mm -hmm. so you really need to be making gains in those key swing battleground states to you know that he lost last time time. that Um, was that he lost last time yeah, exactly. I think it, it's possible that Trump might actually do better than he did in the popular vote, but I don't know if he's making up kind of sufficient ground in, in the states that he actually needs to win. Okay. But that's, that's my political analysis and it's probably as worthless as it sounds. <laughs> so now let's talk about the IPO awakening. That's yeah, our topic today. Because... I know that a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. People are very interested in politics. That's just what I've realized. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there will be this midterm election beginning of November. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting, huh? Be, be keep an yeah, eye there, there, there's, there's definitely some things heating up on the, in the political arena and we politics in the U S it's a full, it's a kind of full contact sport. And it's, it's one of the, one of the biggest shows in town. Yeah. That's uh, cool. I like it. Yeah, we've got the government shutdown to think about. So, you know, a few things that kind of create. You had an episode about that as well? It was an episode about the the debt ceiling, right? So it's a slightly different issue where they shut down the government because they can't reconcile the budget versus raising the debt ceiling, right? And actually issuing more debt. Two two, two separate issues and we've been having separate debt ceiling fights and separate kind of government shutdown, budget reconciliation fights for a very long time at this point. Yeah. So always entertaining. Okay. So the IPOs, so one could think that there are IPOs sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, but the fact is that IPOs, either they are around or they are just not existent. And now we have basically a period of time that we had no IPOs, right? So in the few last weeks, we had ARM, Clavio and Instacart. So what's going on? Why suddenly do we see IPOs again? Yeah, just to set the stage and we've 
discussed this in, in a lot of our prior episodes. The IPO market has effectively been dead for the last year and a half. We constantly get a trickle of microcap names listing, but it has been a pretty long time since we've gotten a major and a very prominent tech IPO. We've we, like we've seen some IPOs over the last year or so. There was a restaurant group called Kava that went public and did did comparatively well. But as far as what you would classically imagine as a VC backed tech IPO, that market has been essentially frozen. We got this set of three companies that just listed Arm Holdings. It's a their mobile chip designer out of the UK, most notably recently owned by SoftBank. So it's a SoftBank spin out but that was a very large ipo raised almost 5 billion at a 55 billion valuation i think it was 51 dollar ipo price so remember that we'll come back to that later instacart obviously a very well known delivery company raised almost 700 million at a 10 billion dollar valuation approximately all 30 bucks was the ipo price and Clavio, which is a marketing automation kind of SaaS company focused on e-commerce. And they offered like almost 600 million, like 570 million at an IPO. I think it was an IPO valuation of 9.2 billion and also at $30. But yeah, these are significant companies and it's a bit of a green shoot in the IPO space. I mean, it's okay. too... Probably too early to tell if, if it's you know completely the IPO market is moving yet, but these names have been on deck for a while and now they're here. Okay. So the question is now why now and why these three and why all at the basic at the same time? But the first question uh, might be interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit why there, there were this time with one? five years without any IPOs. Why is it? Yeah, it's clearly the markets have been very volatile, right? Tech markets specifically, unprofitable tech companies, they basically just got destroyed in the public market. So your entire comp set is severely depressed. If you are a private company and you're used to just operating, you know, on VC capital, burning through basically investor cash, operating unprofitably, just getting that growth at any cost, that market focused shifted very rapidly in the face of rising inflation and rising rates. We've discussed this at length, right? It's an um, equity duration issue, but you know, in addition to that, there's a whole slew of issues, right? But generally speaking, these are unstable, pretty weak markets. And if you're, if you're an IPO banker, that it's a hard sell to a potential client company. And especially if that client company has been able to raise pretty decent runway, which a lot of them did in, in, in 21 specifically. So a lot of these companies that could be IPO candidates, they're pretty well capitalized. They do have sufficient runway. So I think they were just biding their time and they did not want to take that valua valuation down round. You got to remember that, that an IPO is it's a financing round among other things. And so if you go out and you're 50% down from your 2021 valuation within the course of a year, you've crystallized a major down round. Your investors are probably not pleased with the outcome. So if you have the runway, you are just making that um, calculated decision to wait until the markets recover. And to some extent, they, they recovered this year. So just on a broad index level, just to get back to your question as to why now, I can't get into the banker's heads. I can't definitively say what they were thinking, but these are large IPOs. They like any large IPO, they've likely been in the works for a while but they're taking advantage of kind of the relatively calm sanguine markets and the tech run up that we've seen throughout this entire year, especially at the bigger end of the capitalization range. And so these are all kind of bigger companies comparatively speaking. So I think they just made that bet that large tech companies, they seem to have found their footing a little bit in the market and there's not quite the volatility that we've seen the VIX. It, as of a couple of weeks ago, it was down into the low teens. And so that kind of becomes a little bit more a, a, kind of a friendly environment to, to try to do a okay. listing as far as timing. And also bankers need the money. You know, US IPO bankers, I think they picked up less than $400 million of IPO fee revenue this year, which is, no which is very, very low, right? And, you know, for something like an arm, which is a large IPO it generates a hundred million dollars worth of IPO fees for the entire syndicate. That's meaningful, right? That's a large percentage of your total revenues for the entire, for the entire banking industry or that specific part of the banking industry. So basically the, the investment bankers, 
real, really needed some traction in the space of IPOs. That's what also they, reason. They, yeah, they, they needed it. I'm sure they've been pitching whatever company would listen that now is a now again, a decent time to try to do an IPO. And it's only a select group of companies that can meaningfully respond to that pitch. And yeah, you, you, it just happened to be some very, some very large names. Yeah, because you could read in the newspaper different names for possible IPO candidates like Stripe, uh, Discord or Databricks. Then it said, yeah, for instance, Databricks, the people were uh, talking about, is there an IPO? It looks like, yes, there will be one uh, next year. Now we have seen they didn't apply for an IPO. So why we have these companies in particular, these three and not the other ones, for instance? Again, if you're a company and you're being pitched by bankers, you're looking at the state of the markets as well. You're making the bet that you'll list and your stock will at least be stable. And ideally it will show very good sustained performance. And if you're, you got to remember that your average kind of late stage company, a series D and above median valuation has fallen from well over one and a half billion two years ago to 600 million now, which is basically just a small cap company, right? As far as tech IPOs are concerned. So you are, you're still waiting for that recovery. And so there, there's a limited group of companies that, that can do this. There are large tech companies that are still out there. Databricks is, is a very significant company. Stripe is obviously a significant company. Both of those were still able to, to raise money. Stripe did a pretty substantial down round. Recently, Databricks, they've basically held out their valuation, also just closed out their funding round. So they can still, they can still get the capital in the private markets. So that's important, it's important. because it's, it's, if you can find the money in the private market, you keep being private, right? If there's a particular time for a company, then it makes sense to go public. But as long as you can be financed in the private market, the other reasons why you should do an IPO, it, it's not strong enough. So that's why all these other companies, they <clears throat> make you private as, as long as possible. Is that right. correct? Yeah. If you can take the money privately, there are certainly advantages to doing that. Stripe is a data bricks. You know, I, I understand why they did their round. They are an important company. There's a lot of kind of AI overlap with what Databricks does. So they were able to sustain their valuation for the most part. And Stripe, they had to take the down round. They had some structural motivations related to their stock plans that for the most part forced their hand to, to do a very large round to reorganize their their employee their, their employee stock. So that, that was part of the motivation, but they took up almost a 50% down round, but they got the capital and they will certainly live on to fight another day. But for these uh, three specifically, just going through the lists, ARM, as I said, it's a big player. It's a semiconductor chip designer. They license their semiconductor tech. It's a very significant valuation. It's a pretty relevant space, right? There's thematic overlap with what they do, but it's probably not fully developed or realized yet. It was bought by SoftBank in 2016 for 32 billion. So it's a little bit of a profitable exit for that software definitely needed uh, bank, yeah arguably they needed one but arm is a pretty it's a significant asset right so you know nvidia tried to buy them for 40 billion in, in 2020 so it's not a really trivial company i think what is really pretty relevant here is that softbank had an eight and a half billion dollar loan that was collateralized by arm stock that had certain conditions related to, to actually the IPO being completed. I didn't know that. So that is an important part of the calculation. That's the reason why ARM's underwriting syndicate was so large. It's, this, this is the same group that is also financing SoftBank on the back end. So mm -hmm. it's all just a pretty entangled, large- so Yeah, it's um, connected, it's, huh? SoftBank balance sheet play, yeah. Again, it's a very well-known brand here in the US, $3 billion top line company. It has been a- prime kind of IPO candidate for years. It's been at the top of nearly any liquidity watch list for a very long time. That has been the consensus view that as soon as the IPO window reopened to any degree, Instacart would try to try to do a listing. It's um, a great company. It, it has decent growth. It's recently profitable. It's priced and they tried to price it attractively on certain multiples versus DoorDash specifically. 
So clearly a big brand. There's some concerns about competition and moat and their actual partners, their kind of grocery partners actually developing these delivery services of their own that may or may not be cheaper or more efficient. Clearly there clearly is competition. There's DoorDash, right? There's some kind of overhang o- over the name, but as far as metrics, it's they got to that point where they felt comfortable doing a listing. Mm-hmm. And getting back to your kind of broader question as to why these companies specifically, profitability is, is another factor. Mm-hmm. I think you to do anything in this public market, you need to be profitable. And all three of them are recently profitable. Instacart has been profitable for, I think, for the last couple of quarters. Clavio has just become profitable as well, right? And yeah, I think I absolutely think that's a condition. But for Clavio, just to round them out, it's it's not a brand. If you're not an e-com, you probably would not know the brand. It's not a consumer brand, but it has been a marquee name in the private markets for years. And it's probably one of the most prominent names in e-com marketing generally. What else? They really saw a growth through kind of the, the recent quarters that are covered in their filings. It's 50% plus year on year. This is particularly notable in the context of their profitability. Normally when companies push for profitability, right, they cut their marketing budgets. They, everything just slows down, right? So maintaining a 50% growth rate with, with newfound profitability is, 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 it's impressive, right? Whether they can sustain that kind of growth rate and sustain profitability, that's anyone's guess, right? It's kind of pretty rich multiple, I would say for today's market, but there are reasons for it, the growth and profitability reasons, just superficially. And it's not anything like you would have seen in 2021. All in all, it's a pretty strong group to lead with. If you're the IPO underwriter community, it's a pretty solid group of companies to, to try to place. I, I wouldn't make any claims about their future performance just based on that, but pretty strong group to lead with. I'm now thinking of buying, should I buy these stocks or not? And there are discussions in the press about that and also critics. Can you elaborate about that? And so then also then as the, our viewers become a better feeling if it makes sense for them to jump in this game and buy these stocks or not. Yeah. Just, just to address the structural question about kind of these listings specifically, and I'm not going to make any forecast about what the stock does long-term or if it goes up or if it goes down, you know, do your own research. That's the disclaimer, right? Make your own decisions that are appropriate for you. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise uh, it takes another two months to be yeah, ex- signed exactly. off. <laughs> exactly. Structurally though, the one thing that stood out to me about these IPOs that is relevant for, for traders and investors, and they should absolutely take note of it is the really low float on these listings. And the, the float is just the number of shares that are issued in the IPO as a proportion of the overall kind of capital stock of the company. And so for ARM, their float is under 10%. For both Instacart and Clavio, they're under 8%. These are historically very low. The historic average over the long term is something like 30% for all IPOs. It's been just under 20% for the last couple of years that the IPO window has been open, which is considered historically very low. For some really large tech names, they, for a number of years, they've been issuing maybe 10 to 15% floats, which compared to the, the broader set of historic IPOs is very low again, but these are still a standout. Very large tech companies that would previously, when the IPO window was open, these large unprofitable tech companies would list, they would list with a fairly low float. And in many cases, this would be accompanied by a secondary public offering if the public market price held up. So it's a low float. Really, it's an attempt to stack the deck in favor of the IPOing company, right? Because there's fewer shares out there, it makes investors chase a smaller number of shares. It makes the stock hard and more expensive to borrow for shorting. So it can support the price, right? Um, on the flip side, it, it can potentially lower the liquidity in the name. It can create volatility because of the low liquidity. It can limit some buyers from, from buying your IPO or participating in it. So like some ETFs, they have a 10% minimum float to, to buy an IPO with like for ARM, for example, $55 billion company. It is a foreign company, so that has that kind of has that additional complication to it. But there are ETFs out there that track large cap tech that potentially can't participate mm-hmm. in, in the stock just because of the low float. 
so in the end, how did that go? How did they do at, at the uh, stock market? <laughs> Yeah, with all that said, with all with the low float and all the all the attempt to drive these companies, give us some visualization. Yeah, to produce that listing, it's been it's been tepid on the whole. You know, the run up to all three of these IPOs, they seemed strong enough. They were very oversubscribed, which is not surprising given the very low float. The pricing was upgraded multiple times for each company. But public market trading, is, it has been pretty subdued. Here we have Clavio, right? Pretty decent uptrend, but still not still not above its the highs that it, that it saw on its initial pop, right? And Arm and Instacart are basically flat to down. So you got to remember the offering prices, right? It was fifty one dollars for Arm, and it was thirty bucks for both uh, Instacart and uh, Clavio. And as of yesterday, this is where they were. And Clavio of the group seems to be doing a little bit better, but it's it's pretty muted trading overall. And I said all three are trading below their initial pop. <clears throat> so why is that? On the whole, I would say markets are not totally recovered. I mean, if you're looking at just the pure index level, they're doing all right. It's been a very healthy year, right? But as we've discussed numerously, right, previously, it's it's still a very top heavy market. It's still pretty depressed under the surface. And some of the themes that have been driving stocks this year, they seem to be they seem to be taking a break. So AI, those names are kind of range bound for the most part. You know, moderating inflation, there's also been a bit of a backtrack in in that theme and there's also just a, con a lot of concerns i think over hanging markets generally right is the is there still a potential recession in the us around the corner right is what is the commercial real estate sector what's the fallout from that um going to be like there's a residential um real estate market freeze essentially in the us right and we've been getting some fresh data on that and it's it is what you would expect right very high mortgage rates they just freeze up every market it's a meaningful part of the economy. There's some rumbling from abroad. There's a Chinese balance sheet recession of sorts that is probably playing out as we speak. There's geopolitics, there's energy prices. You see where oil is right now, right? Which has a geopolitical dimension to it. The production cuts by Russia and Saudi, we are now at $90 a barrel in oil. We're paying well over $6 a, a gallon here or where we live in California. So that is an inflation driver. It's not core inflation driver, but it's it, it's caused a bit of a reversal in, in the moderation of inflation, which has been a very important macro theme overall, right? Uh, as, as far as, yeah, and I, I also think that last week was, it was interesting timing because it was also the September Federal Reserve meeting of the FOMC here in the US. And that kind of, created a, a bit of a detractor, I, I think for stocks and for tech stocks specifically. And so the September meeting, it's important because it's the quarterly meeting. So they have these every single month for the most part. And generally they just give you a rate decision and a press conference, right? As to why they're doing what they're doing. But every quarter, so in June, September, every quarter, they also accompany that with what are called SEPs. So that's the summary of economic projections. So this is where they give you the economic outlook for a few years out and their rate outlook for a few years out. And so getting back to the FOMC, the announcement itself was not a big surprise for the markets. It is, it is essentially what was expected. So they did not raise rates again, as expected. Consensus view is that there's still another rate hike on deck for this year. Mm -hmm. But what was a surprise was the, the dot plot. And it's this thing that you have up right now. And the dot plot is basically a survey of the individual FOMC members. So the members of, of the Federal Open Market Committee, the governors of the Federal Reserve, where they expect rates to be at any given year. Okay. And as you can see, there's usually a bit of dispersion in that group. They all have different opinions, but the kind of grouped together and taken at their median, this is generally interpreted by the market to be the, the outlook for rates, right? This is not policy. This is just outlook in the context of, in the context of kind of the, the best of the Fed's knowledge right now. So it can change, and it did, right? And so the notable factor here in this slide, or kind of in this meeting, was that they they made the dot plot a lot more hawkish. 
And so the dot plot that we see on the left is the June meeting. And importantly, for 2024, the median estimate for the federal funds rate was 4.6%. And so if we end the year at 5.7% this year, that implies a fair bit of cutting that needs to happen in 2024 to get to 4.6%. They upgraded that view, or at least they made that view a lot more hawkish, right? So if you look at the dot plot on the right, this is the September meeting. And now the group before it's centered around 5.1%. So that is a pretty significant step up in that median dot plot projection. The Fed did this because they also significantly upgraded their economic projections generally, right? So for this year and for next year, they are looking at First of all, better economic growth than they expected last quarter, higher inflation, lower unemployment, right? And in the context of all of that, they need to keep rates or they think they will need to keep rates for higher for longer. Hang on. So what you, uh, what I read between the lines, could it be that these IPOs, they assumed that we keep going with the left picture so that probably even there would have been a, a perspective or even lower rates at this point, which then would lead to a much higher price for their stocks. Or is that this is now I, I, I think it has been the hope and the expectation of a lot of market participants that, <laughs> well, yeah. that, that, the, that the Fed would already be cutting by this point. It's reflected a little bit in kind of the shape of the yield curve and where that's been for you know quite a while at this point. I'm pretty sure the commercial real estate industry was really hoping that the Fed would get back to cutting this year. They have a lot of commercial real estate credit that, that is variable rate effectively, and it resets. And it doesn't seem like they're going to get much relief, right? If we're at over 5% on the Fed funds rate, it, we're going to be in a, in a pretty tight credit environment for a while, or at least a higher rate credit environment for a while. And once those rates reset, they're going to reset to, I'm, I'm sure, a higher level than anybody expected. And, and I, I think just generally for the market, for bankers, yeah, I, I think that was part of the presumption of the stock recovery is that rates were never really that far around the corner. Mm -hmm. But the Fed has been talking that narrative down as much as they can. We are getting a bit of a resurgence in, in inflation. It's mainly driven by energy. There's not much the Fed can do about it. The labor market has stayed strong. We, we're, we're seeing some deterioration in the labor market. There's been some downward revisions of, of payrolls and whatnot. Initial jobless claims are, are just ever so slightly rising, but nothing is, is deteriorating precipitously, right? And the Fed, I mean, they told you exactly what their attitude was going to be. They said that they were going to be very data dependent in how they run their policy because they really missed the boat with the transitory inflation. Yeah, we've idea. talked often about that point that they were yeah, behind the yeah. curve. Yeah, exactly. So here they're doing what they can to kind of marshal as much concrete hard data as they can. They're just trying to, I, th I think they're, they perceive there, there to be a risk of not doing enough. And they're just very cognizant of where we are realistically, and they're shaping policy around there. And if, if we're in a better growth environment, if we're in a better labor environment than initially expected, that's arguably a good thing. But it also, it's not, it's not what the market necessarily wants to hear as far as rates. We have, we're not the most kind of rate sensitive that we've been as an economy. Mm -hmm. But there's still a large swath and large sectors of the economy that are quite rate sensitive. And all of it is integrated, all of it is connected. And that's just how the market reacts. And in, in response to, to this meeting, stocks have been, been pretty soft going into last week, going into the FOMC. Uh, but they didn't really take the news very well, right? There was some knee jerk volatility. The VIX, it shot back up to almost 20. It's at 17 at this point. Right. Like it's not, this is not the only contributing factor to it. I'm sure government shutdown, whatever else is also creating a little bit more. It's unsettling things a little bit more, but on the whole, it's made the broader market. It's made it more difficult for the broader market to kind of break out to the upside. Bond yields, they spiked. The 10 year is at it, its local cycle high, right? It peaked at, I think over 4.6%. It's 4. Point, it was 4.58% yesterday, last time I checked it. 
That's the benchmark rate kind of maturity that, that I watch. The yield curve has been, the yield curve has been moving around. There's a big spike in very short term yields, as you would expect. I, th I think it just generally put a damper on, on stocks and general appetite for equ equities. So there's probably an outflow of, there, there's probably kind of market outflow from, from equities and from tech into stuff that is not really been performing all that well for the last you know year and a half, like energy. We're back to getting back into getting back into commodities into into oil. So, so what's the um, outlook then for these three stocks? So, what, what can we expect? Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to make predictions on the stocks again. Otherwise, it, yeah, the, this episode will be signed off in three months. Otherwise, yeah, this episode goes into a compliance vortex, never to be seen again. We certainly don't want that. I, I would say that macro is is still a pretty standout overhang over the market and has a pretty significant, pretty significant impact. Just being kind of broadly aware of kind of all the macro moving pieces would be important because tech, as we've learned over this entire market cycle, going back to COVID and tech is very macro sensitive in very specific ways. It is rate sensitive. It has this whole kind of private VC backed ecosystem that, that, that feeds into it and it's all and there, there are very specific major macro drivers that kind of make that whole ecosystem work and keep the capital flywheel turning over, which it, which it really hasn't been. It, it, everything has slowed down and these IPOs, the, they're an attempt to get things firing again to some extent. But I think for these companies specifically, the one thing that I think traders, investors need to be aware of is the lockup expiration, um, especially in the context of, of low float. And just to explain lockup to your listeners who may not be aware, whenever a, a company goes public, they have a whole cap table, a whole list of investors and employees, and employees and yeah. that, that, that they had from the time that they were, from their founding, right? From the time that they were a private company. And when a company IPOs, they, they for about six months, for most companies, the, the only stock that trades in the market is the stock that was issued on a primary basis in the IPO, right? To actually raise that cash. There's usually a secondary piece to, to most IPOs, to, to most large IPOs, but that's basically the essence of it. All that private stock, it is locked up typically for some period of time. The standard for IPOs is six months. So if you're a VC investor, if you're an employee, if you're a founder, as soon as the stock IPO, you typically can't sell. Mm -hmm. You have to wait six months, right? And companies, they structure these in different ways. I think Instacart has a, has some portion of their stock that's owned by their employees that is, is either liquid now or going to be imminently liquid. I'm not sure, but you know, every single S1 filing, it, it you know, very specifically defines what the lockup considerations are for any given company, but standard it's six months. And in six months, everybody is basically unrestricted and free to trade, right? And for all of these companies, ARM will set that to the side because there's clearly the SoftBank component and SoftBank still owns 90% of it. What they will do is a, a, a SoftBank specific story. But for Instacart and, and Clavio, they have lots of employees. They have lots of investors. They've been around for years. They all want- They know, want to see cash. Of, some, some kind of an outcome, right? And so most of that float is still locked up. And when it ceases to be locked up, it, it, it remains to be seen, but it's just, it's a very important factor. So I think for Clavio and Instacart, the lockup expiration is really going to be a major test for just how solid of a footing they have in the market. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, the price will drop. Maybe the price will drop. Maybe there'll be some volatility. Really anything can happen. Yeah. Right? As you have explained in the previous part of this podcast, it, it will also depend on the macronomics in six months from now it it yeah it absolutely will so when, whatever the kind of the, the dominant market narrative it is going to obviously impact trading because so, tech has been it, it's so much in the spotlight right for this mm -hmm. entire market cycle and so i i don't expect that to, to stop being the case interestingly investment banks don't have a lockup at least in the us correct Investment banks have their own kind of provisions in, in IPOs. They've got green shoes and over allotment options. The way that they manage their book is very specific to, to investment banks. 
So what they do is basically designed to optimize the listing, to optimize their business. And it doesn't really apply for most shareholders. It's just, a, it's a, just inherent to the mechanic of, uh, of the IPO happening. And also, again, for the viewers, when they want to trade these stocks, it's also interesting that, for instance, Coinbase, they had a direct listing and there you have no lockups, right? You, exactly. Direct listing, the difference there is that it's not, it's a more, I suppose it's a more streamlined way to get to market because you're not issuing new stock. Mm -hmm. So you you don't have to go through some of the steps that pertain to the primary stock issuance of, of registered publicly tradable securities. And so Coinbase did one, I think it was Spotify was another direct listing. And there's been a, there's been a number of others They're they're comparatively rare, but sometimes when you're a, when you're a large and you're a well-capitalized private company, you don't necessarily need to dilute any further mm -hmm. and you just want to create liquidity for your investors, direct offering is a way to do it. So you as a, Oceanic is like later stage of pre-IPO investment. So do you know these three particular companies from the, before they went public more in detail? Yeah. Yeah. As kind of private market operators, intermediaries and investors, we're very familiar with Instacart and Clavio. Arm, not so much because it's, it's it has its Solve own it's kind of bank. Unique, unique corporate history, right? It was SoftBank owned. But yeah, Clavio and Instacart, definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I, the, the takeaway from the private market experience for those two, it's something of a cautionary tale, among other things. Of the two, of Clavio and Instacart, Clavio is the one that is closest right now to its private market high watermark valuation wise. Back in 21, they raised money at nine and a half billion dollar post money valuation, and mm -hmm. it's you know right around nine billion right now. So it's just under that. So comparatively speaking, they're doing pretty well, right? It, it goes to show you that whatever the market conditions are. Strong growth can still carry the day to some degree. And especially if you combine that with profitability. Instacart, definitely not as fortunate. They last raised money at a $39 billion valuation and they're at 10 billion right now. So that is a gigantic haircut that's trading it. Yes, yeah, like me. That kind of haircut. So you have a total haircut. It's like zero. zero. Yeah, no, like it's free. It, 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 it's also the haircut is for free, basically. Yeah, very efficient, very streamlined. But yeah, no, Instacart, thankfully for them, I suppose they did not go to zero. They did raise money at $125 in primary VC capital back in 21. At $30, you can see the magnitude of that valuation rewriting, right? Just it's realistic. So. Yeah, you know, and, it's, and it's not really, I would imagine it's, yeah, that, that would have been uh, a pretty outlandish multiple in this day and age if they tried to do anything close to that valuation. But interestingly enough, as far as the private secondary markets where we, as Oceanic, spend a lot of our time, both Clavio and Instacart, mm -hmm. as richly valued as they were at their peak in the private secondary markets at kind of the peak of, at the peak of that, they were trading at even higher levels. And I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that Instacart got bid up higher than it's than that you know than its primary price per share. Um, Calavio, I think, got up into the you know, mid to high 40s, if I recall. And these are these are professional and sophisticated players and accredited investors from the VCs on down. And I think, broadly speaking, it goes to show you that some even some really sophisticated investors can be swept up in in these market cycles. Cool. So. So when we circle back to the, the beginning, Tim once said, you have a, a period of time with no IPOs. And then when there is some IPOs coming up again, that this is an early signal. So what is the future? What do we expect? Is there now a wave of IPOs breaking over us or not? Not yet. I would say it's too early to tell. These are not like, res they're not resoundingly positive results, right? So if we got a 30, 50% pop for each one of these companies that, that stuck, and especially if it stuck around through lockup expiration, that would be meaningful, right? And it's still too early to tell. They're mainly treading water. The, the flip side of that is that they're not dropping by 10 to 20 points per day, right? 
that might be a function of the listing, it might be a function of profitability, it might be a function of the low float, but the, the stocks are, for the most part, holding out so far. So it's a bit of a green shoot in the IPO market. It's not a definitive one yet, I would say. There's still, again, a lot of market overhang that, that can, again, put a freeze on it. But we've got some really, some really prominent and some, some pretty interesting companies that there are on deck. Birkenstock is the next one, the sandal maker, right? right. A bucket of, of yeah, profoundly in, interesting companies. Also a, a, a really pretty historic brand. Turo, the car rental company, they've been keeping their IPR registration filings updated. And there's a slew of other ones that are large and sufficiently developed to try to do a listing. Clearly Stripe and Databricks and those are all we, Discord, right? We can't say that there's a definitive IPO timeline, but there's certainly large enough um, that they could try something at some point. Um, but again, they will, they will try to raise, um, you know, VC money if they can, uh, without taking a valuation haircut, without trying to brave these markets. But there's a, you know, there, there's a lot of companies um, in the hopper that could do something like this when the markets are just a little bit more supportive. But that feels like pretty energized. So there is a wave building up and the longer it takes, the bigger the wave becomes. So once we see better circumstances, the macro perspective, yeah. the rates, and that is a perspective that the rates could go down, then that might be the trigger, right? That well, pull the trigger. Yeah. And again, we've discussed this, right? Like rates going down they they generally go down in response to something. Then something breaks, yeah, as you yeah, always yeah, say. Yeah, 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 generally things break. And generally there are kind of rate cuts and other accommodations for when they break. We might have just an orderly reduction in rates over the long term. We'll see how the market responds to, responds to that. But when conditions are supportive enough, there's, there's just a lot of companies that can list, right? So if, if mm. we get to that environment where there's an appetite for risk assets and equities and tech equities there's a lot of there's a lot of properties and a lot of brands that you know bankers can bring to the market and a lot of companies that have been around for years and are large pretty significant businesses at this point so when when that properly reopens i i think we'll we'll see some pretty exciting activity but too early to tell as of yet last but not least what does that mean for the the early stage uh, vc investments is it parallel or is it something that is behind or is the front running? That is a complicated question with a complicated response because when you're talking about the Instacarts and the Clavias of the world, that they are reflective of the very mature late stage part of the market, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is as proximal, it is as kind of proximal and integrated with the public markets as, as it gets in the private markets. The kind of the late stage sector generally has, has suffered quite a bit over this entire market cycle. And it, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's the one thing that's pulling everything down, but it, this entire capital life cycle needs to work, right? You need companies moving through it. You need companies stepping up their valuations. You need companies moving from early to mid to late in a pretty orderly constructive progression for everything to work. And it really has not for the last two years or so. And if this, if these three and whoever else lists in the near future, if they, if they can find solid footing, that is arguably pretty good for the late stage sector. They can be a little bit more confident about their, their comps and about the, the market environment that they're benchmarking themselves to. And that, and that, and that would stabilize the entire capital cycle, which would be supportive for early stage names as well. At this point in time, I think the, the early stage market, it um, has a lot of factors that are unique to it that are animating it, right? So companies are trying to, you know, these very early stage startups, they're trying to rework their business models. I think AI has been a huge impact on a lot of them. I mm -hmm. think any like new AI product release, it has, it has a significant impact on, on on, on little startups that have been working on products that don't have an AI component. It basically takes them out of the game or it forces them to, to pivot the business model or, or product. Um, and so they are in the midst of making those decisions. They're trying to get capital wherever they can. Some of them are, you know, reaching the end of their runways, but early stage is it, it's a very different thing, right? You don't have the metrics. You're not expected to have profitability. 
you're very reliant on the availability of venture capital, which mm -hmm. has been you know, comparatively not as available. And early stage deals are getting done, but at a slower pace for sure. If, even if you're an early stage company, you recognize that this is not the best environment for you to raise money, that you're not going to get the valuation that you might, that you might want. You might not get the terms that you might want. And so yeah, you're just kind of, you're just, you're working around those, working around those realities. And so in speaking with some early stage investors here, it's a challenging environment for them as well, right? Even if you're an investor with capital to invest, there are not as many early stage startups that, that want to take the money under, under those terms. And clearly there are different kind of quality buckets for, for companies. I'm sure there are. There's a certain subset top decile that will always get funded on whatever terms they want. And they'll have kind of the perfect business model, the perfect fit for, for our day and age. It doesn't apply to everybody. So there, there's a lot of kind of unique and specific factors to, to early stage. So the, those founders are still trying to contend with this environment, but if we get again, a, a healthy resurgence of IPOs, we'll get a healthy resurgence of late stage deals, which pulls up mid stage deals, which pulls up early stage deals to, to some degree. And again, it orders the entire capital life cycle and makes it a little bit more predictable. And it, it's, it just becomes a, a, a more uh, kind of a more standardized path for companies to, to follow, which is not quite the case yet. Exactly. So basically it's a top down story and it all starts with it's, it's yeah. a top down and bottom up story and upside down and inside out. So, <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Thank you very much for simplifying it. Of course. Okay. Hey, that's it. Thank you very much. And yeah. Subscribe cool. to our YouTube channel. Well, yeah. Yeah, good, good, good to chat as always. Lots of yeah. fascinating stuff to talk about. Hopefully we can get these names on the radar of, of your viewers, just as a gauge of where markets are and where we are as a society and as a species. Yeah, it goes up sooner or later. It will go up again. And life goes on indeed. And you have your wine in front of you. I have my work. Yeah. Your coffee. I'm wine. <laughs> See, you. See you next time. Cool. Bye. All right. Thanks for everybody. Having.